Hello, this is Dane Cialino, and I'm here today with Ernie Svensson to talk to you about using mobile devices to assist in your law practice. Yeah, we're going to cover um, some of the basic tools that you would use to get more work done while you're out of the office because, of course, every lawyer who has an office likes to get, get away from it from time to time. And we're probably going to talk mostly about the iPad. And I think what you're seeing on the screen right now is a projection of the iPad that we're using with our mind map, which is sort of our guidepost for what we're going to talk about and how much in depth we're going to get with various topics. So that's one of the things we'll talk about maybe at the end is how you use your iPad to project onto a screen and to use it in court and in hearings and so forth. So that's what we're going to talk about, and uh, thanks for, for joining. What, what we've got, as uh, Ernie's already said, projected on the screen is a uh, live screenshot of the uh, of what is on our iPad just so you can see what what we're using at this point what we are using an iPad mini which of course uh, the iPad mini was released sometime in uh, I, I believe it was late 2012 yeah about a year ago and it has uh, quickly really become by what uh, most experts who have evaluated these uh, these gadgets the the, the most uh, probably useful and easy to use of all of the tablet computers out there now, even more so than the original iPad, uh, the updated iPad with the Retina display. Uh, I think for most people, really, the go-to tablet is now the the iPad Mini. I, I know it is for you. Yeah, I mean, I think that the Android tablets are good. I mean, the Samsung Notes have gotten good reviews. I have not played with them, but people who have used them have said that they are very good. I think the big differentiator for lawyers is that there is a, a, um, a longer history with the app ecosystem for iPads. So you're more likely to be able to find the kinds of apps that you would use as a lawyer. And when you find apps for your tablet, in this case the iPad, what you're going to experience is that those apps have been out for longer, they, they're more mature, um, there's more thought that has gone into how to make those work in a very user-friendly way. So, I mean, you know, computer's a computer, a tablet's a tablet, it doesn't really matter. If it gets the job done, that's great. I think the reason to get an iPad over an Android is twofold. Basically, um, there's more hand-holding that comes with an iPad. Um, it's set up uh, to be more user-friendly. You can go into the Apple stores to get help. It's, it's just a lot easier to get help. But mainly, it's the fact that there are all these applications that have been out there for a long time, which we will be talking about in a little bit. Yeah. Uh, iPads, Androids, iPhones, no doubt mobile is hot as uh, the first branch on our mind map says, and and because it's hot, that's what we're we're talking about. The um, you know I don't have the stats at at the ready on the screen here, but suffice it to say that a large percentage of lawyers are now using iPads uh, or other tablets in their daily uh, or or at least weekly workflow. Certainly for travel and reviewing transcripts. Uh, keeping up with email and whatnot. So uh, using uh, or, or how to use a, uh, an iPad is something uh, or, or other tablet in your practice is something that I think is critically important for all lawyers to understand and that's what we're, uh, we're talking about. Well, what are some of the strengths of using an iPad? And, and we're going to talk about iPads now. Uh, I, I would imagine much of what we're talking about would be translatable to an Android device or other tablet. Uh, a Windows RT or whatever other tablets are out there, but but Ernie, what do you think some of the the strengths of the iPad and, and likely other tablet devices are? Well, one of them is that when you want to turn it on, if it's off, you just touch the screen, swipe, and it's instantly on. Uh, that's that's huge because it means that you don't burn a lot of battery life leaving it on in case you might want to use it or waiting for it to boot up if you need to boot it up. So it's instant on, instant off. And then the battery life is exceptional. I mean, both of my iPads, I have an iPad mini and a full-size iPad, I do get about 10 hours of battery life. And 10 hours of battery life means I can use it all day long, and I don't really ever worry that I'm going to run out of power at some point during the day. So I've been traveling with my iPads where I've been working the whole time, and by the end of the day, I still have power. Yeah, it, is, it really is amazing. Now, the new... Uh, uh, Intel-based Windows computers and, and of course, uh, the, the new MacBook Airs that came out just a few weeks ago have the new Haswell chips, the fourth-generation Intel Core chips. 
that will give laptops a pretty similarly similar battery life right. of roughly 10 hours, 10 to 12 hours, depending on the type of machine and what you're doing on the machine at any given time. It used to be that, that uh, only tablets could give you that, that kind of uh, uh, longevity. But that, to me, uh, th this 10-hour battery life on the iPad is something that makes it critical for traveling. You can always have something to check your email. You're never going to run out of batteries as right. long as you charge it up every, every day. Right. Next, uh, next bullet point we have here is on reliability. Yeah, it's a very, I mean, they're very reliable. They don't crash. Um, I've had on my iPad, and I've had one since they came out, I've had instances where an application didn't work well, and so all I had to do was kill that one app and then restart it and everything was fine. I don't, I don't think I've ever had to reboot the iPad because it was acting goofy. I, I certainly never have, which is amazing because yeah. uh, I reboot, reboot my computer every now and again. Even this morning when we were getting <laughs> ready to do this lecture, right. I rebooted twice. Well, I tell you not to get a Windows computer. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, the reliability is key. And so the thing is the more you start to use this as a primary device, um, and, of course, that takes learning to feel comfortable with it and knowing how to do it. But the more you start to use it as a primary device, you obviously don't want it to crash when you're doing something important. And what's interesting to me is that it really is a rock solid machine. So if I know I'm going to do something on an iPad and I feel comfortable using it for that task and let's say I'm going to go to court and present something, I feel actually more comfortable with an iPad than I do with a computer. Uh, it's certainly not going to glitch out on you. No. Nope. Uh, next point, easy to read on. No doubt about that. I mean, if I'm going to sit down and read some content, like if I want to read a law review article or I want to read uh, some uh, news posts, I, I much prefer to do that on my iPad than on my computer, even my big screen computer that I have at my, my home office, right. which is a 29-inch screen. I'd prefer to sit down on a couch or a chair and read that content on my iPad. Yeah, I use it for RSS feeds, and I know that a lot of people haven't you know bit the bullet on this but it's a really great way to consume a lot of content there are applications like Flipboard and Feedly and all these different applications that let you pull content from a bunch of different sources that you're interested in so instead of having to log into various different sites that have uh, the particular topics you're interested in you can have them all funnel into one one application and read it there and so I use the RSS reader on my iPad mini and I find my iPad Mini is great for reading. I have a Kindle app. Um, I, you know, anything I need to read, I would rather read it on an iPad. Yeah, and another nice thing about reading, for, for example, a, a Kindle book on your iPad is as you read it, you can cut and annotate and and uh, really call out all the stuff that you might want right. to use later for a blog post or yeah. for whatever it is you're researching. Yeah, yeah, and have all that stuff synchronized across all your devices. Very, very beneficial. Uh, Non-invasive. So, what does that mean? Well, to me, I, I don't know what the right or the best term for that would be, but to me, um, it's something you experience if you have brought a laptop computer to court or to a hearing. There's something about flipping up that screen that creates sort of a barrier. And um, Jeff Richardson, who has the iPhone JD site, which we'll talk about in a second, refers to it as playing that old game of Battleship, where you know the other side couldn't see what you were doing which is great if you're playing a game like that where you need to have your privacy, but if you're in court and you want to establish rapport with a jury or with a judge and you don't want to seem like a cagey lawyer, um, carrying an iPad is more like carrying a, um, a legal pad, whereas carrying a laptop, first of all, it's cumbersome and clunky and you look awkward carrying it up to the podium and try to get it positioned just right, whereas an iPad is really just like holding a small little book. So it's a completely different social dynamic that occurs when you're using an iPad, which I think is, is a good thing. Yeah, uh, next point, very portable, which is fairly, fairly obvious. The last point at, on, on just kind of this introduction is, is, is what can you realistically use your iPad for? Now, we all agree that it's great for consuming content. By consuming content, of course, we mean reading your RSS feeds, reading a deposition, reading a book, reading your email. It is more challenging when it comes time to actually create content. Now, if you're going to create an email, a short, yes, I'll be there tomorrow email, uh, it, it really is not difficult. Of course, no. it's just as easy as doing it on your iPhone, maybe a little easier since right. you've got a bigger keypad. But when it does come to sitting down trying to do heavy lifting, and uh, like, for example, for writing a brief 
or something beyond just a mm-hmm. short letter. Uh, not even to mention using it to uh, to to do case map type functionality, which of course you can't do on an iPad. Right. It, it becomes uh, more of a uh, you got to be realistic about this. And, yeah. and when I think about it, I think about a chart with on one axis uh, you have the volume of information that you're processing and then on the other axis you have the difficulty of the information that mm-hmm. you're processing. Toward the easy end of the, the bottom left hand side of that chart where you just very low volume, very simple, like answering an email saying yes I'll meet you for lunch at 1230. That's simple. At the other end of the spectrum, the top uh, or the, or the chart, the top right of that chart where you're dealing with a high volume of information and it's complicated stuff. Like for example, trying to write an appellate brief and you are trying to juggle transcript excerpts, exhibits, case excerpts, statute excerpts, mm-hmm. a lot of volume and a lot of uh, heavy lifting. Uh, unfortunately, the iPad, I think, uh, I-, I couldn't write an appellate brief on an iPad. Oh, no. Well, I mean, I think the thing, you know, you're absolutely right. And I think that that's, you know, we, we always advise that people, when they're using their computers at their desk, get two screens because having as much screen real estate is important if you really want to be productive. So you're definitely not going to be as productive with an iPad if what you're doing is creating content. Ab- absolutely right. I will say, though, that I have found, as I've gotten better at understanding what I can do with the iPad, at feeling more natural about moving things through because now I know how to do it and I don't have to think about it as much, I'm able to edit content and also create little snippets of content that I can use elsewhere. So for example, um, in writing a brief, you know, you, you know, maybe you have an idea one day for a section in the brief and you're in a coffee shop and you just want to blast it out. Well, if you're comfortable using Dragon Dictation or you're comfortable with an external keyboard or however it is to get those thoughts out of your head somewhere into the iPad, you can email those things to yourself. So you can keep certain balls rolling that are happening back at your at your desk that you um, probably wouldn't work on at all if you didn't have your iPad with you. So it's, it's more a question of learning where can you do certain things. I don't think you're right. You cannot create complex content. I mean, you could, but I mean, it would be harder and why would you do that? Um, but the more comfortable you feel with the iPad, the more you can use it as a tool when you have a brilliant idea and because it has instant on, you fire it on, you fire it up, it's on, you dictate or you get the content in there and you do something with it. So I think that's the value of it is learning where you can use it to fill in gaps. Yeah, and there's a sweet spot there and yeah. it's different for everyone. Absolutely. It's just a matter of what, what your level of comfort is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, that's, uh, uh, those are some of our thoughts on, on the iPad in general and uh, what you can do with it and can't do with it. Uh, In our next segment, we're going to turn to another topic. Okay, now we want to talk about a few general aspects of the iPad, talk a little bit about um, kind of uh, naming your iPad, basics of, 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 of setting up security codes, talk a little bit about internet access, notification sounds, privacy, and the iCloud, and then finish this segment by talking about about security. All right, well, first of all, naming your iPad. Is it like a pet? <laughs> no, the only reason to name the iPad is so that if you have several iPads and you're backing them up, uh, when you go to look to see what's going on with the various iPads, you know which one you're looking at. That's really the main reason. All right, so give it a name that makes some sense. So if you decide you're going to get an iPhone or an iPad mini, it's just not iPad. Yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, auto lock. The auto lock, you, you want the iPad to be locked when you're not using it. Now, the, the thing there is it kind of depends on how much time you want um, to elapse before it goes into auto lock, but you definitely want to enable auto lock. So your choices are two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or never. And you don't want to pick never. And so mine is set to two minutes. And what that means is if I stop working on my iPad and I turn it off and I come back a minute and a half later, I don't have to enter the passcode or swipe or do anything to activate it. The screen just pops up and I'm ready to work. Um, you're going to want to enable a passcode lock. And so I've done that. And that means that after two minutes, um, it's, it's not just that you have to swipe the screen, but rather you have to, um, to enable the passcode lock and then enter the password 
which is a four digit password and then you're into the device and you can mess around with it. So I think that every lawyer, given that they're going to have confidential information on their iPad or the iPad's going to be a conduit to confidential information, they should at least turn on the four digit code. Um, it's not so secure that if you gave it to Edward Snowden, you know, he wouldn't be able to you know, hack it in about 20 minutes, but it at least slows down somebody from getting to your data. All right, now the iPad cover lock uh, unlock, how is that different from a passcode lock? Um, that's the thing where if you have that smart cover that Apple sells or any of those other kind of covers, when you open it, you don't have to swipe across to get it open. It just knows that because you've opened that, that, um, that cover that it should go on, unless, of course, you have auto lock enabled or passcode lock. So it's, it's the same thing. It's just a convenient way of uh, activating the iPad simply by opening it up and flipping the cover open. All right, using the side switch to lock rotation or mute the device. Now, of course, we all know to mute our device when we go to court, so it's right. not dinging and beeping while the judge is trying to talk. Uh, but what about, can you use that to lock rotation as well, the yeah. same switch? Yes, you, so in the general settings, you have the option in there, and you can go dig in and find it, to use the physical side switch that it's at the top right on the side of the iPad, top right. You can use that switch so that if you want to mute it, you can use the switch for that purpose or you can use it to lock the rotation. So given that you can mute the iPad by simply using the volume control, there's no reason to use that button um, for anything other than to lock the rotation because that's what you're more likely to want to do quickly and easily is if you're sitting um, in bed and you're reading and you, you know, lean over, you don't want it to suddenly flip to portrait mode or vice versa. So that's what locking the rotation does. So it's, it's more likely that you're going to want to use that button for that. So that's what I would set it to and then see if you like that. If you don't, you know, you can go back to the muting. But muting is easy. You just hold down the decrease volume button and just keep holding it. And after a second, it just jumps down and basically mutes the, the iPad. And I would not say that all lawyers know that. I mean, when you go to court, you need to make it your habit to mute all of your devices because there are judges out there that will confiscate your device. Oh, some of them often. get very angry. Yeah. Okay, uh, enough about some of those general issues. Let's, uh, let's talk very briefly about Internet access. If, you know, of course, you're going to use your iPad to access the Internet, either through, uh, through Wi-Fi networks or through, uh, if you've got the right I iPad, through a cellular data network. Right. Yeah, and I mean, at this point, we're going to talk about this in security, but there are reasons to prefer to use your cellular data options unless you are absolutely certain that the Wi-Fi is secure. So it's fine to use Wi-Fi in your home if you have passwords set up for your Wi-Fi network, which you should, or in your office, same thing. And um, But it's not probably a good idea to go use the Wi-Fi at the coffee shop. Um, it's a better idea to use the cellular data. And for a while there, it was more beneficial to use Wi-Fi because it was faster. But nowadays, with the 4G network and the LTE networks that most of the big companies provide, it's actually faster to use the cellular data than it is to use the Wi-Fi in a coffee shop. Yeah, and it's just a matter of if, you, if you've got enough headroom on your account. Uh, some people have unlimited data, uh, and I, I envy those people. I get 10 gigabytes mm -hmm. per uh, month, and I share that with my three kids who are downloading videos and sometimes we push the 10 gigabyte head run. But I would think for a lawyer who's using their device for work and, you know, for kind of entertainment, but not downloading movies, 10 gigabytes is more than it. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I mean, all, and both Verizon and AT&T and probably Sprint's not far behind allow you to do this kind of thing that you're talking about where you can pool a data plan amongst all your devices so that instead of having to figure out how to manage the data usage with each one individually, and sometimes you're paying too much or too little, you can pool it all and get the benefit of the fluctuations across all of your devices and not have to pay more than you need to. So they've all figured that out. That's a good deal for you. And if you have several devices, I would definitely check with AT&T and Verizon to see if that makes sense for you. The, the one other thing I would mention is the possibility of using your iPad or your iPhone as a personal hotspot. Um, and what that means is if you have a device or, you know, let's say your computer that um, does not have access to the internet other than through Wi-Fi, you can make it so that you can share your cellular connection on your iPad with your computer by flipping the personal hotspot function 
which then creates sort of a mini Wi-Fi network that's very secure and your computer can now use it. So, All right, a um, couple of brief thoughts about notifications. Of course, there's a notification center in iOS where you can go and turn on various levels of notifications, whether you get a, a, a screen notification right on top of your screen, whether you get a little rolling banner at the top. Again, just uh, that's all a matter of personal preferences. But one thing that I would imagine some of you don't know about is the do not disturb function. Clients will bother you at some of the oddest hours. You don't want to be disturbed after 10 o'clock, for example. You can set your phone so that no one can call you other than, for example, people on your favorites list or other people whom you designate to get through. And, and that does give you some ability to sleep, which is, which is nice. Now, it may be that if you do, for example, criminal work, you want to answer the phone late at night if somebody's in jail and, and wants to know what to do. Well, then you don't use the do not disturb function, or you can set it so that if somebody calls more than uh, once in a, I believe it's a three minute period, it'll let them through because right. obviously they want something important because they keep calling back. Right. Uh, all right, um, as far as sounds, you should turn off the keyboard click sound, especially if you're going to use it in court, because that's going to make a sound that's going to annoy the judge and the jury. Yeah, don't do that. Um, the privacy, of course, if you have a GPS-enabled iPad, then it's going to keep track of where you are. So you just need to be aware of that and decide whether that's something you want it to do. And if you don't, then just turn off the location services. You can do that on a per-app basis, so some applications will want to do that. And of course, your GPS app is useless without it. So um, that's just something to pay attention to. I make my kids turn it on so I can track them incessantly. <laughs> All right, last point that we want to, or issue that we want to address in this segment, iCloud. iCloud is something that's baked into iOS that allows you to register your device with Apple, back your device up into the cloud, and also use it for some storage if you'd like. And most importantly, I think, allows you it allows you to enable uh, find my iPhone or find my iPad functionality that allows you if you lose your iPad to uh, to send a message to it that will pop up to anybody who, who sees it will allow you to track it on on a map so you can actually see where it is you can send a sound to it so it will beep and and uh, you can find it under the uh, under the sofa simple uh, very simple to set up you just go into your preferences and you uh, you enable iCloud and find my iPad, enable storage and backup. That uh, will effortlessly allow you to find a missing iPad and to backup and restore all of your data uh, very, very quickly. Yeah, and we should say it's not actually called Find My iPad. It's called Find My iPhone, but that's just the name of it, and it really works on the iPads and iPhones. And, you know, same thing. Okay, well, in the next segment, we're going to take up the issue of security. Okay, now we're going to talk about an issue that is critically important for lawyers who, of course, as, uh, as lawyers, we all owe a duty of confidentiality to our clients. We also owe them a duty of, co of competence. We need to make sure that our clients' information is uh, is not lost and is not shared with those um, we, we don't want to share it with. So that's what we're going to talk about now is security on uh, on iPads. Now of course if you're talking about security of documents that you keep in your law office you know how to keep those secure. You keep them in if, if unfortunately you're still using paper you keep them secure in, in file cabinets behind locked doors in in your locked office. If you're paperless then you are keeping your computers safe by using the uh, passwords to protect them, perhaps storing up in a cloud storage device with encryption and whatnot. You still have to keep those basic principles um, uh, alive, or, or at least uh, be aware of those basic principles when you're using your iPad uh, rather than a, a computer that is back at, at your office. Okay, so what are some things, Ernie, that in practice we can do as, uh, as lawyers using our iPads and other mobile devices to make sure that we protect our client information? Well, the number one thing I think right now is um, first you should use passwords to access your material. I mean, I think that's really number one. 
um, <clears throat> you know, people talk about using cloud services like Dropbox and the fear of the cloud and all of these kind of things. And to me, those are obviously valid concerns uh, because as lawyers, we are responsible for our data and for our clients' data, and we should understand how that data might be accessed and we're, how, how it might be compromised, and we should minimize or eliminate those problems. And the main way to do that is uh, to use passwords. And that means um, using strong passwords. And that means also using different passwords for each cloud service that you access. Because if somebody finds out your password, let's say for your online email account, and they're gonna naturally assume you're using the same password for all of your accounts, because that's what most people do. And then they're gonna try that same password everywhere. And if you have different passwords, they will be limited to the one thing that they got access to, and you'll have more time to keep them out of the other areas that they'll try. So it's very important to have passwords for uh, your important data online. It's important to have passwords that are very difficult to guess. And most people, studies have shown, uh, use passwords like 123456, or admin, or their name, or their dog's name, or something that's exceptionally easy to guess. So that's, that's a bad practice, and you shouldn't do that. So that's number one. Make it hard for people who are targeting you specifically or who have access to your device to get in. All right, number two, using Wi-Fi. Of course, you, you are going to want to be almost constantly connected to the Internet when you're using your mobile device. And usually you're going to be, it really depends on where you are. If you're at your office or at your house, you're almost always going to be connected via Wi-Fi. And, and there's nothing uh, really perilous about that because your home network should be set up securely with a secure network password uh, such that other people can't readily share the same network with you. So what we talked about with regard to secure passwords applies not only to you, passwords associated with your device, but also to passwords associated with your, your, uh, your Wi-Fi routers at, at your home and your office. Now, in public places, everybody's sharing the same Wi-Fi. And uh, once you start swapping bodily fluids like that with other people at Starbucks, you are then in danger of somebody at Starbucks uh, trying to be cute, maybe even worse, uh, deliberately trying to steal information that, uh, that could be confidential or financial information or otherwise put you, your uh, financial well-being or your client's confidentiality in, uh, in peril. Now, most of these people are looking for credit card information, secure, social security numbers, things that could be of use to them. They're not really looking for the motion to compel you filed last week in the Smith versus Jones case. But having said that, best practices would dictate that you not use your iPad in a Starbucks or similar environment when you're doing in, uh, you're, you're engaged in not highly, any kind of confidential communication. That's just best practice. Or, as the next uh, branch on the iPad suggests, use your cellular connection, your LTE high-speed connection, and, and that'll get you a much more secure and uh, less dangerous route to the Internet. Now. The last thing we want to say about security in this segment is encryption. People talk about encryption. When lawyers first started using uh, email in, uh, you know, in, in doing their work, they stopped uh, or, or, or they, they questioned whether or not all email should be encrypted. Well, the answer to that is no, it doesn't need to be encrypted. And I would think that lawyers almost never send encrypted email. I think I've only sent encrypted email once, yeah. just for grins, to see what it was about. Yeah, I think it introduces a level of complexity that's not generally needed, but there are opinions, and I think the most recent opinion to come out was from Connecticut about cloud services, and they did mention encryption, and what they said was that you should use encryption, or at least consider it, if you're sending an email to a client and you know that somebody else has access to their email account. So for example, if you do domestic work and you're sending an email to one of the spouses that you represent and they're Im imminently involved in a divorce, then you know if they tell you, yes, my husband has access to my email account as well, 
you're not going to send emails to that person without either encrypting it, which probably would need to encrypt both the subject matter and everything else, or just calling them on the phone. But in other words, the idea is you have to think about who has access to the file. So you might have to use encryption sometimes, but if you find that that's the case, um, if it's average person you're dealing with, they might not be able to tolerate the encryption process, so it might not work well. Uh, if you do want to use encryption uh, with documents, there's a lot, several programs that will let you do it. The one that's most popular right now is called Boxcryptor. We're not going to get into how it works, but it is kind of complicated, and you will find that you really need to be, um, have, you need to have a strong use for it to justify introducing it into your communications equation. Right. Last two points to make by way of security. We've already talked about passwords. One thing to think uh, hard about, and, and I, I would say stop thinking and start doing, is to get a password manager. Now, one password is, is a pa password manager that uh, you should consider. There are others. KeyPass is another leader in that field. The one that I use is called LastPass, and LastPass works on your desktop computers. It works uh, on the web. It works for uh, on all your iOS devices. Uh, I would suggest that that's one that you should strongly consider. Which one do you use, Ernie? I use 1Password, and really I use it just because it's the one that worked on the Mac. Um, nowadays, all of these programs, LastPass, 1Password, RoboForms, they're all cross-platform compatible. So it really doesn't matter which one you use. They will work with all of your devices and all of the platforms that you have. The key is really just to pick one and use it. And the thing, so to understand completely how they work, the idea is, and the reason why 1Password is probably the best product name description, is that it's one password, and it needs to be strong, not one, two, three, four, five, six, and then you, um, you use that to get into the program, and from there you can use it to open up all of the other services that you use. So you have them all inside of one application that's encrypted, secure, nobody could hack into it in a million years if they had, even if they had physical access to it. But from there you can jump off and enter your passwords really quickly, or you can enter your credit cards. It's really easy to fill out forms with these things. So it actually makes your life easier once you learn how to use them. But it mostly makes them more secure, which is the main reason to use them. Okay, well those are our thoughts on security. Let's now talk about document management. And, and document management is so critically important to talk about for lawyers because we are uh, document managers. We spend our, our time uh, processing information and recording that information in documents. And by documents, I don't just mean word processing documents. I mean all sorts of documents. The documents could be uh, photographs, they could be spreadsheets, PowerPoint shows, they could be um, video recordings, you name it. What we're talking about when we talk about document management is, is the, uh, managing the information that you are working with as a lawyer. Well, to what extent can you or uh, will you manage documents on your iOS device? Well, if you're going to do any work on it, you have to get access to the documents that you work with on your principal computer, whether it's a desktop computer or a laptop computer, you have to readily be able to access them, number one, and then uh, read them, number two, and perhaps edit and manipulate them, uh, number three, and related to that, uh, number four, create new documents. Now, the iPad uh, is not as good as your principal computer. In, in managing, creating, and editing documents. That's just a, a simple fact. For example, if you're working with a document that has lots of footnotes in, uh, in tables of contents, tables of authorities on your principal computer, you're not going to be able to manipulate and, uh, and work with th those sorts of bits of information uh, either as well or at all on your, on your iPad. So uh, that's what we're going to talk about now when we talk about, about document management. Reading, creating, editing, uh, and working with the, uh, the different types of, uh, of files that you work with as a lawyer. All right, Ernie, first of all, it says handles uh, different file types. Yeah, well, the iPad I mean, will handle, just as a computer will, the same kinds of files 
that you use on your computer. It'll manage documents like word processing documents from Microsoft Word or from WordPerfect. It will handle PDFs, it'll handle Excel spreadsheets, it'll handle PowerPoint files, it'll handle a lot of different kinds of file types. These are just some of the ones that it will handle. The question really is, how do you get these documents onto the device in the first place? And there's a couple of different ways that you can do it. In the beginning, the only way, in the beginning, when I say the beginning, when, when the iPad first came out three years ago, the only way to get the, the documents on there was either to physically connect the iPad to your computer and then through iTunes drag the documents over from iTunes folder to your iPad and then it would synchronize and they would be on there. That was very cumbersome and people didn't like that. It was annoying. It was, you know, just it just wasn't user friendly. So the other way to do it in the beginning was to email yourself the documents and then open those documents up in some other application. And we'll demonstrate that in a second, and that's a reliable way that will you know, ensure that you can get the documents on. So as long as you can email it to yourself or someone else can email it to you, you can get them on. As long as you can email it to somebody else, you know how to do that, you can get them off. But the real sweet spot for most lawyers who want to be hyper-productive is using some kind of third-party software because there's no good software with, with Apple that lets you manage all these, all these various um, file types on your iPad because there's no centralized file storage per se on an iPad. So you're going to have to rely on one of these cloud storage services as sort of the conduit and then find an application that lets you tap into that conduit to get your device, to get your um, your files onto your device. Yeah, and you know, just on that point, on, on the, the way that the I, iOS devices store your documents, that's been one uh, thing that I think many people have complained about universally is that, uh, that the iOS devices store documents uh, on a, a per app basis. All of your doc, your word processing documents, your pages documents are kept together. All of your, um, I mean, you, you name the app, the app keeps together the documents. Now, that's not the way that we've advised most lawyers to organize their files. We don't want lawyers going to their word processing folder and then within that folder looking for client files. We want you to go to your client folder, then the matter folder, and then in that folder, find all of the documents that relate to your case. Now, unfortunately, you can't do it that way on the iPad, which is unfortunate. There is a rumor, and it's all you know, rumor that that eventually will be one of the new bits of functionality that's going to get worked into some future version of iOS. Again, who knows? Yeah, you can't do it natively on it. But you can't use it. You can't do it out of the box with the iPad. So you can do it. It's just that you have to supply the additional magic. So to do that, you have to find some conduit other than email through which you can move your documents back and forth. And then once you get them onto the iPad, then you need some sort of program or application that lets you organize those documents together into so-called folders so you can have nested folders, if you will, which is the paradigm that we're used to on our desktop. So, so the services that you would use and these are just four of the ones that, that are out there, and these are probably the biggest ones, are Dropbox, SugarSync, Box.com now, their original name was Box.net, but now it's Box.com, and then Google Docs. Now the one that I use is, I, every now and again I'll use Dropbox, but I use almost exclusively for this purpose, SugarSync. Okay. Well, let's open up SugarSync and we can take a look and see what that looks like. Yeah, th and this is the iOS, the iOS interface for it. And this is more along the lines of kind of a traditional looking nested folder way of, of organizing and storing documents. So for example, uh, right now we are looking at the sample documents folder that's in the magic briefcase. And just by once we've opened up that folder, we can see that in that folder are PDF documents. And uh, we can click, for example, on the, the, uh, the user guide and it is downloading. You can see the blue bar up at the top. It's downloading the user's user guide over the Wi-Fi network. And then a reader allows you uh, within the SugarSync app to simply read the document. Now, I, I really can't do much with the document. I can, I can read it. 
I can, if I want to, uh, send it, uh, open it in another application, or I can send it to someone uh, via mail. But uh, you mostly are, at, at this point, are just going to use it, at least within SugarSync, to just take a quick look at it, to send it to somebody. Uh, and, and as long as it's a readable document, like a PDF or a Word document, you can do that. Now, within the SugarSync app, are you going to be able to edit a PowerPoint show? No. You're not even going to be able to open a PowerPoint show. But it, it does give you access to all of the documents that are in SugarSync. Now, of course, this goes without saying, but like so many things, I'm going to go ahead and say it. This presumes that all of your documents back on your principal computer are syncing with SugarSync. They have to be syncing with SugarSync uh, in order for them to be available to your iOS device uh, once you open your SugarSync app. Remember, your SugarSync app is just going up to the cloud, looking to see what documents are resident there, and pulling down the ones you want to look at and see. It can't magically put them up there for you. You have to have enabled that back at your principal computer. But assuming that you've done that, SugarSync is a very, very powerful and simple way to access documents, principally PDFs and Word processing type documents or spreadsheets uh, on your iOS device. Yeah, and Dropbox works the same way. And, and the big limitation of using these programs to do anything more than just get them onto your device and maybe organizing them is that you can't really manipulate them. You can't edit them. You can't, you know, highlight and so forth. That's not something you can do within the Dropbox or SugarSync app. Um, and the Box.net app has some commenting features, but they're very minimal. So to, to manipulate these PDFs, once you've got them in there, you're going to need some other kind of, um, some kind of other device. So, so syncing is one thing that's possible when you use these apps, like Goodreader, for example. You can synchronize to these cloud services and typically they all allow for one-way syncing, meaning, as Dane said, once you've got the documents up there resident on your computer and then resident in the cloud, you can pull them down and synchronize them that way pretty easily, but it's less likely that the application will be able to synchronize it in both directions automatically. Obviously, that's what you want, and you want it to happen automatically, but that's not really a reliable thing. That, that's, you have to kind of pay attention to what's going on. There's a lot of likelihood for things to get out of sync or for, to create duplicates, and that's going to create a headache. So one-way syncing down from the cloud to your iPad works really well. Two-way syncing is probably an advanced, uh, an advanced feature that most people are going to have trouble with. Yeah, I, I don't use it. I'm a power user of, of these cloud services. Uh, and my my principal computer and and the iOS devices that I use, but I, I don't. I just for some reason still don't trust making a change on my right. iOS device and sending it back up. If know. I'm going to do any kind of serious work on a document, uh, I'm going to do it on my laptop or my desktop rather than my iOS device. Absolutely agree, and I don't do that either. So those are your options with that. Now the the other there's an application that you can use which will connect to Dropbox, to SugarSync, to Google. Drive to to Box.net to a bunch of different services and it's called Goodreader, and there's there are other applications that will do this. This was really the first one that did it, so it's been pretty popular, and it will let you read documents. Now it won't let you see footnotes if you open up a Word document, but it will let you read it. It will even let you mark up PDFs. Can we open up Goodreader? Yeah, to let's see what open the, up Goodreader. So down here at the bottom, I have the Goodreader icon and all I've done is I'm fast switching between the two applications. So Goodreader's there and you can see over on the left hand side there's a panel that says here are the documents. I've created folders for different documents. Um, these are dummy folders and then you can drill into these folders and then find additional information. So if I click on the one that says PDF Talks uh, that's, a, that's a, got a couple of different documents in there. It's got um, a talk that I gave that I converted to a, a PDF. It also has a CDC subpoena form. So if I click on that, I can pop it open and start reading it right away. See, I can flip through it. I can even, uh, if I tap on it and hold, let's see. Over here I have the option to, um, to highlight the form if I want to, to highlight certain words in there. So within Goodreader and working with PDFs, you have the option to annotate the PDF. 
Um, there's some things you can do with Word documents as well. You can you can play movies. So, but this this program, though it lets you manipulate documents, really still is to me created mostly as an organizational tool. So the the benefit of this tool is that um, is let's see, I'm going to cancel out of this. Cancel. Is that if I go back to over here to this view, is this ability to organize documents? And so I can manage files, and let's say I want to um, delete one of these. I could click that and then move it or delete it, and I can cancel out of that. And let's say in the PDF Talks one, I want to delete the subpoena form. I could do that, or I could open it in another document. So I can um, say I want to send it as is without flattening the annotations, which would compress them all and make them un uneditable. And at this point, I could open it in some other application, like, for example, Adobe Reader. And if I select that, it's going to hop on over to Adobe Reader. It's going to open up that document in Adobe Reader. And I'm going to be able to do, in Adobe Reader, whatever it is I can do in Reader. So Good Reader as a, is sort of a conduit to sending files to other applications where you can work with them in the best way that you need to. So you're starting to see how because there isn't a centralized file structure, what you have to think about is A, getting the document onto the iPad, B, deciding what application do you want to manage your documents in. And so if you were working on a case, you want to put all your files under the Smith versus Jones folder, and maybe you want to have a pleadings folder and a correspondence folder. You can do all that in Goodreader, but you're probably going to want to open those things in other files if you want to work with them. So you can see that now you've got three different things going on. First, you've got your cloud storage service, you know, Dropbox, let's say. Then you've got Goodreader to pull it in to organize it. And then you might want to send it over to a different application. So as George Carlin used to say about maintaining stuff, you know, supply lines are getting harder, you know, longer and harder to maintain. That's what's going on here. So you have to think about what you're doing, and it's easy to get confused. Yeah, and out of all of these uh, these applications that that you can possibly use um, to uh, to to kind of manipulate these documents, the one that I use almost exclusively. I I first started using Good, using Goodreader when I first got my iPad because just as you said, that was the first to the market uh, on dealing with PDFs and Word documents and whatnot. But now I use almost exclusively. A PDF expert. I use this because it works seamlessly with SugarSync. Of course, I, I use SugarSync to get all my documents up in the cloud in the first place. And then I use PDF expert to read uh, documents and also to sync. Now, uh, here, for example, is a document that you're that we're viewing in, uh, in PDF expert. And this is the interface. Again, similar to the to the interface in Goodreader. But um, you know, if you want to get to your documents, what you do is you go to network, and you hit network, and then you go to the server, and you hit uh, the server, and it goes down and pulls down all the folders in that server. And once it pulls down the folders, you can go in the folders and then look to see what documents you you have in there. And again, it's uh, you know it's pretty simple. For some reason, this is taking a little longer than yes. Yeah, oh, there we go. Uh, like for example, so th these are all of Ernie's uh, Ernie's folders up on SugarSync, and uh, excuse me, uh, that are up on Dropbox. Now this is a very uh, this is what I use. Like for example, suppose I'm getting ready today to go to a court hearing in Baton Rouge on the uh, let's call it the funny case here. Ernie's got a file called Funny. What I would do is I would highlight Funny. Okay, now I'm in Funny. I would hit the button up there that says sync. I'm not going to do it now because there, there, there are you know, many megabytes that would then begin to sync. I would hit sync, and what that would do is that would pull down from my uh, SugarSync account. Well, here it would pull down from Ernie's Dropbox, but the same thing. It would pull all those files down right now and put them uh, on a local folder within PDF Expert. So then I would, ac I would access those documents here on the documents pane rather than on the network pane. What? Do, why would I do that? Well, because I don't want to be fumbling around in court looking for a network connection 
maybe wondering if I got a cell connection. I want the documents for the Smith versus Jones case on my computer, on my iPad, uh, locally. So that way I can be sure if I start looking for a document, I'm going to have it at the ready. Now, what do I do when, I, when the court hearing is over? Well, usually I'll just delete the local files, unsync that folder. And uh, that way I don't, I don't get my iPad bogged down with all the documents that are all otherwise available up in the cloud. Now, suppose I forgot to sync it before I left. That's fine. I can, using a cell phone connection or a Wi-Fi connection, I could sync it out on the road or, or just download documents one at a time as I need them. I've been doing this as a workflow for, well, ever since I got my iPad. So when I leave my office, I never leave with any paper. If I uh, think that I might need some documents while I'm out on the road, I have generally synced them with my iPad. And if I haven't synced them, then I know that using PDF Expert uh, in conjunction with SugarSync, I can get every document in my life and, and have access to it out on the road. And also, if somebody calls and says, hey, can you send me the, uh, the complaint that was filed against me last, night, last week in the Joe, versus, uh, the Joe Smith versus uh, Jones case, I can just share a document very readily from within PDF Expert or SugarSync. And it, uh, again, makes it effortless to, to uh, organize documents that way. Yeah, and basically what you've done is eliminated one of the three elements that we talked about earlier. So you're taking, if, if you need to get the document onto your iPad, you have to pick one of those services, so you pick SugarSync, uh, and then you're skipping putting it into GoodReader because you know that you're mostly working with PDFs, so why not just put it in a program that lets you deal with PDFs? Well, and you know, PDF Expert can open other files. Sure. It, well, it, it, well, in fact, the one that you, we were looking at there at the bottom that says Motion for Summary Judgment, is an Apple Pages document. Yeah. So if we click on that, what it's doing is it's opening an Apple Pages document. And that, that see, that's right. another. I mean, talk about eliminating having to look use a lot of different right. programs. PDF Expert. I, I don't have off the top of my head what different files types it can open, but we all, of course, know it can open PDFs. We know it can open Pages documents. It can open Word documents. Right. I think it can open PowerPoint documents, though I'm not sure. Uh, but but it can open Excel spreadsheets. It, it can o open a whole range of uh, a whole range of, of documents. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, that's all I, I think we need to say right now about basic document management. Um, There's th one one thing I think we should show real quickly is what happens when you how you get a document into one of those programs. So, this is our dummy email box. Let's say I emailed myself a long boring contract. If I click on this button in the top right, as we showed earlier. I can click on that and say open it in PDF Expert. It's going to go over to PDF Expert. At that point, it's in there. I've saved it in there. So that's the process, getting it from email into PDF Expert. Yeah, and again, that's just another way to get it in there. If, yeah. you, if you don't want to use SugarSync, or, or if somebody, for example, I mean, if somebody sends me a document, a PDF or a Word, and I'm on the road, I'm almost, if it's a document that I'm going to want to comment on or highlight, I'm not just going to open it in the mail app. I'm going to do what you just did. Right. I'm going to open it up in PDF Reader so I can annotate it and uh, and then send it back with, with changes. Yeah, so email is really going to be, in many cases, the easiest, simplest way for you to move documents between yourself and other attorneys. Your at, least if, at least at first. Yeah, you, sh you should at least master it. You need yeah. to master that first, and then you move your way up into using these additional programs. Let's, uh, let's talk real fast about using Adobe Reader, which is another application that you can use to look at PDFs, to do a little bit with them. It's free, but the thing that I like about it is that it lets you, well, first of all, when you download it, there's a, a manual that explains how to use it. And the manual is itself a PDF, of course. And so as you go through the PDF, you can uh, swipe to see, let's see, I'm gonna go to page one, hold on a second. So you start on page one, it's going to tell you, here's how you get started with Adobe Reader. It's going to say, swipe to the next page to get started. So we all know how to swipe from one page to the other. It's going to explain to you how to open documents, which we demonstrated earlier with mail, that there is this icon with a square box and an arrow pointing to the right, and that's your open in arrow. They also explain that you can do the same thing in Safari, the browser that comes with iOS. 
So those are two ways to get it into Adobe Reader or any of those other applications. So we already demonstrated that. Once it's in here, what can you do with this document? And then here the, here's where they explain to you how to use this application. So if I tap in the screen, it's going to demonstrate a toolbar. And in that toolbar, I can choose to save it to acrobat.com. I can choose this option of navigating from page to page in a different way, of saying continuous. I can also choose to annotate it with highlighting, for example, if I want to. Um, I can choose to um, open it in another document or email it. And I can also search within this PDF to find text that I'm interested in. That's not a lot of functionality, but that's pretty much most of what most lawyers need. The one last thing it does is it has a bookmarking function, which will help you find pages if they have been bookmarked. You can use that to navigate through. So um, continuous lets you change it um, so that instead of having to, to swipe from right to left, you can go this way. Um, we're going to change that back to single page. And really, it's pretty basic. So it, it shows you everything that you need to do to manipulate a PDF. The only thing that it doesn't show you, which I think is incredibly useful, is if you tap and hold, you have an option to either create a note or add some text or add a signature. So if I wanted to sign a document, I could put my signature here, then hit Save, and then you'll see that the signature appears. If I tap on the signature, I can change the color to red if I want to. I can change the thickness to make it super thick. I can change, you know, I can delete it, I can do what I want to, but that you just have to remember to tap and hold. That's not in the tutorial itself. But I think this is an incredibly useful application. It's free. It will open any kind of PDF. So if you have trouble opening a PDF for some reason in one of the other applications, you can be sure that Adobe Reader will probably work. Yeah, and that's the only time I've really used it. I mean, I, I try to do all of my document uh, reading right within uh, PDF Expert. But there are times when PDF Expert can't open a PDF, and then I wind up using the good old trusted mothership Adobe Reader. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it's openable, it, it will open it. The only other thing I've used it for is for signatures. But, uh, but PDF Expert, now one of the more recent versions of PDF Expert, has a functionality very similar to that. Mm -hmm. So my recommendation is pay the, I think it's around $10 to yeah. get the PDF Expert app become very proficient with that, make that your principal app for reviewing PDFs and other documents, and then download the free reader just to have in case you've got a document that won't pry open, you can use it for that. Uh, but, but really beyond that, it's, uh, it's, it's really my j just kind of a, for me, an insurance policy that I will definitely be able to open up a PDF if I get it. Yep, I agree. All right, well, let's finish up by talking about other capabilities that your iPad has. And we're not going to go into a lot of detail about these apps, but we just want you to know that they're out there. And uh, in, in some future lecture we, uh, or video, we very well will likely address these. Uh, but but for, for present purposes, you just need to know these, these apps exist. You ought to go find them on the iTunes store download them, play with them, see if they're of interest and of use to you, uh, but, but hopefully you'll at least know they're there. First of all, litigation apps. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a ton of litigation apps. They're being developed all the time. The ones I would say that are currently out there that most lawyers should at least know about are two. One is called Transcript Pad, and the other one is called Trial Pad. Trial Pad is for displaying documents at trial. So for those of you that are familiar, with the computer software applications called uh, Sanction or Trial Director, both of which are $600 programs. TrialPad is an $89 program that pretty much lets you do the same thing, um, at least to the extent that most lawyers would ever be using those, those, those programs. So it lets you display things. It's very difficult to demonstrate because it takes over the screen and it has a function that prevents you from displaying a document or displaying the screen unless you hit another button, and so it's, it's very difficult to display. The reason for that, of course, is you don't want to accidentally show something in court. But transcript pad... Well, it, just before we move on from trial pad, trial pad, I mean, if I were going to use an iPad at, at a hearing or a trial, if I wanted to present anything, I would do it with trial pad. I wouldn't try using even my laptop computer. 
I would bring my iPad, transcript, and trial pad and put whatever demonstratives that I wanted to use on that and that alone. Right. Uh, so it, it's really that reliable and, and that simple to use and very easy to get the documents in there using right. doc, uh, using Dropbox or using email. Right, yeah, no, and so, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's for presentation. Now, it's expensive. Yeah, it, well, $89 is expensive in the ecosystem of I, I, iPad applications. As I mentioned earlier, a sanction and trial director is six hundred dollars. So, if you compare it to those programs, it's very inexpensive. And it's better. Yes, really. It's well, it's a lot easier. It's simpler, and it's something that won't confuse most attorneys. So, it's, All right. that's that's um, that's trial pad. Now, let's look at transcript pad, which is the companion application that lets you review transcripts. So, here again, similar interface to PDF Expert, to Goodreader, to all these other applications. There, there's a panel where you can look at folders, you can create folders, and then you can drill in. So let's look at the folder that has the Ned Patterson transcript, which is a demo transcript that comes with this program. You can scroll through, you can read the transcript, that's all fine and good. When you get to a place that you think is important and you touch the first line, and then you touch the next line that ends the discussion, you're prompted with a little screen that lets you pick from, a mis from among issue codes that you may have already created, such as in this case, damages or liability, or I could create a new one and say, um, uh, you know. Sample. Uh, sample, yeah. And then I could pick a color for it, make it yellow. So now I have the choice to assign that issue code, but I can also, so let's say I pick sample and I get out of this. All it does is create a line there to the left that shows that that is an issue coded area. It's just like the red line over here is issue coded for liability. If I want to highlight it and have it be um, all, let's see, let me do this. Let me hit uh, this one here and then down here. But this time I'm going to hit highlight and yellow. That's going to make that whole area highlight and yellow. At this point I can also assign it one of those issue codes such as sample. So now I go through it this is a quick and easy way to read a deposition, mark it up, tag it with the issues that are relevant in that case, and then ultimately after you're, you've done that, you can send it out and create a detailed PDF report, a summary report, all that kind of stuff. Right, so and, and, and this, is, this is very good, and you've seen a, a lot of the functionality here. Uh, in July of, uh, or late June or early July of 2013, the uh, uh, LexisNexis, who makes the case map and text map, companion programs came out with an iPad app for text map which is the transcript uh, management utility that works like I said with case map I've played with that it does almost the exact same thing as this but what's better about it is it integrates seamlessly with text map and case map so that once you are on the airplane and you've made your notations and you've tagged transcript excerpts to issues you can send it back via email to yourself, open it in text map, and then it's it's saved all of those changes. Right. Yeah. And I and I because I use case map as well and text map as well, I would use that application over this one. I'm showing you this one so that you know that it's available. This one's forty nine dollars, so it's not as expensive as TrialPad. I mean, sorry, as um, uh, yes, it's TrialPad. It's not as expensive as TrialPad, but the case map program that you're talking about is free. So if you've already purchased case map and text, and text map, map it will that's free the app is free yeah and there's no reason not to get that because of course you have those powerful tools and you're going to want a transcript review tool that integrates with what you're using on your desktop right all right well those are some thoughts on litigation apps uh note taking you know the ipad is very good for taking typewritten notes if you're using a, a, a bluetooth keyboard you, you can use it to take uh, pretty extensive notes but you can also use it not, not so effectively to take handwritten notes. Now this is really, we don't have time to go into it at this point since we're almost out of time, but, but the leaders in the field uh, here really are Notability, Good Notes, uh, Penultimate. I've never used Pair Notes, but I would think Notability, Good Notes, and Penultimate are the best ones to take a quick look at uh, and, and see whether they'd be useful. Not only do they record uh, your handwritten strokes that you might make with a stylus or your typewritten notes, but they also record sound in sync with the notes 
so you can go back and listen to whatever it is you were make uh, the audio of whatever it is you were making uh, notes about. Also, uh, one good thing about, for example, Penultimate is that it syncs with Evernote, and Evernote is uh, is an app that uh, I think personally is the single most important app. Uh, no, I hate to say that. <laughs> One of the most important hey, apps I agree. that you would use, not only your iPad, but for just generally clipping information, making quick notes. Uh, I personally, when I take notes on the iPad, I use Evernote because then it easily syncs up with all of my other notes on my my principal computer. And um, it, it, without a doubt, a doubt, that's the my note-taking app of choice. Now, it doesn't have some of this functionality about that, that notability has with syncing audio with the notes. You can take an audio note in, in, in Evernote, but you can't sync it yet with the handwritten or typewritten notes. But but in any event, the, those are the, the, the note-taking uh, apps that you need to think about. I, I would actually add Evernote to that, really. Yeah, we should have added Evernote. We should I have, agree. We should have added Evernote to that. Evernote is, is, is both for note taking and just kind of general for uh, kind of clipping information and, and being a, an information pack rat. Uh, Evernote is, is what I think we all need for that. Uh, last two things to think about, news apps. The one that, uh, that I use is, uh, is it's not on there, but it's um, uh, Feedly. Do you, do you, what do you use I now? do. Well, now, yeah, because now Google Reader has shut down. You have to have some way to synchronize your uh, feeds, and so I use I use Feedly as you do because that's the most reliable way to synchronize feeds. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just a matter of whether you're using RSS feeds to keep up with goings on and news and sports, weather, technology. Uh, I, I'm a fanatic, and I keep up with all that stuff uh, too much. But what I use is Feedly. Uh, I used to, I've played around with Flipboard, Instapaper, and Mr. Reader. Feedly is just my go-to app. It's only been my go-to app for about a month, but it does what it, I need to make it do, and it, and it does a good job at it. Last thing, travel apps. There are innumerable travel apps out there, and uh, I've used TripIt, for example. I use Orbitz, Travelocity. Uh, my favorite is not on here is Hipmunk. Uh, if I'm going to go out and find, try to find a flight, I'm going to try to find it on Hipmunk. Mm -hmm. But you know, there, there are so many of these uh, travel apps out there, and this is uh, really kind of uh, goes a little beyond what we're talking about here as as lawyers. But uh, lawyers travel, so lawyers need to think about uh, about about travel apps uh, on occasion. Okay. Yeah, I think that pretty much covers it. So um, hopefully you guys got some good information. I think the main thing to remember is to get some kind of PDF management tool. And so I think that's Dropbox and Adobe Reader to start, and then ultimately SugarSync or PDF Expert. All right. Thanks for listening.